This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote at FBHP.com. Farm Bureau Health Plans celebrating 76 years of providing Tennesseans with high quality health coverage at an affordable rate. With Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, and we're joined in the Snickers hot seat today by the newest member of Titans Radio, Ramon Foster. Welcome. Thank you. Woo-hoo. Thank you, Bob. Welcome to the Snickers hot seat. I see them over my left shoulder. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was wondering were they real? Were they real? They are 100 mm-hmm. real. Mm-hmm. If I want to grab one, like Amy did last week, I could. Yeah, you could. I could. You should. I should. I think that there should be more eating and less talking on this show. So that's, yeah, that's your policy. That's my policy. Well, but we want to talk to Ramon Foster because. Uh, we're excited to have him as part of Titans Radio. Absolutely. How, how has he done in his first three games on the sidelines? How would you grade him? Oh, phenomenal. It's, uh, and I, I mean, this is not just me talking because he's sitting right here and he's a very big dude. <laughs> um, really, truly, it's been fantastic to listen to. You seem like you've been doing this forever. And the insights that Ramon has are so interesting. Mm-hmm. He sees the game in a completely different way than I have ever seen the game, or than I would think a lot of people see the game. Just the things that you notice on the sidelines are so different than what I notice. And it's really interesting to listen to, and your voice just fits in very well with the group. And that's a real thing. That is a thing. Uh-huh. It fits. I appreciate that uh, because I knew there was a lot of pressure. Amy has held it down. And, of course, following her up, being a part of you guys' crew for so long, I was thinking to myself, don't mess this up. <laughs> Please get Amy's approval, okay, after game one. And uh, a part of everything that I've done so far has been because our conversation we had was mm-hmm. really good before I took the f- sidelines for the first time. But you guys might keep you, Coach Mac, Red, uh, just everybody involved, Phil Noel, Brad, Everybody's just been a part, have welcomed me in to make me feel that comfortable to where I could just do my thing on the sideline and see those things that uh, you guys maybe up top don't see. And uh, it's been it's been a real cool experience so far. So I appreciate that. You've played 11 years for the Steelers. You're only four years removed from being an active player. How different is the sideline view as a quote unquote member of a radio team compared to being on the sideline as a player? Uh, it is slightly different um, just because I, I have the opportunity to see everything now. The defense makes a mistake. I can see that more clearly now. Uh, the conversations between the coaches and the players on the sideline is something that you don't see because you're so locked in as a player. So getting an opportunity to always wonder what that was like and actually being able to do it now on the sideline is the reason why I'm so engaged. I have to tell myself sometimes talking to Philip in my ear, I got to shut up because I'm calling <laughs> out everything that you guys are already talking about because I, I'm so into the game because as a player it, you was always told if you're not actually playing watch what's going on at the field so that you can digest stuff and so that you can communicate uh with the coaches something they may miss so my first year in the nfl reserve role for the most part so watching the right tackle and the left tackle at the same time was always something that was on my hit list to make sure that we didn't miss anything so now being able to watch the flow of the game or understanding long down and distance situations well they're probably more likely to to throw the ball right here or uh looking at the way the stances of players are i can tell when they're going to run the ball i can tell when they're going to pass the ball and just being alert for that especially in a matchup situation uh i'm watching Danico autry this past weekend and seeing the way the tackle set against him or uh, the way he set his feet up I figured it was going to end up being a pass rush, and it was. Or third and one and watching Danico attack the the tight end split and split both of them for TFL. Like, I enjoy watching the the process of a play developing, which is why I want to lend my expertise to you guys. One of the things that's so interesting to me is that five different people can watch a football game, and they all see completely different things. True. And it depends on the perspective that you're coming from. So I watch a lot of football with Mike Keith, obviously, because we work so close together. And the way that you watch a play develop or the way that you watch a football game is very wide because you are used to calling a game. And so you right. see the whole field. 
when you watch with a former player a lot of times, you see that position and they are so locked in in the intricacies of how a certain position or a certain side of the ball plays when you watch with a coach you get more not strategy but you get almost more minutia when it comes to a specific play or like that broke down or this guy was supposed to go there and they see in a very different way it's so fascinating to me and it's one of the things about sports that I think is so cool and I think is kind of unique to football in that there's so much happening on a single play there's so many things to digest I just think that that's an incredible thing and being able to have that on Titans radio, having the coach's perspective, the player's perspective and the overall perspective of what's happening in a game. I mean, what more could you want? And that's fascinating you say that. I, and I've always communicated with you guys where I'll be at on the field. I like to watch the team that um reviewing the Titans from behind. The offense put me behind the offensive line. That's my lane right there so I can see this team go down the fence because that's always how I played the game. If I'm watching the defense, I get behind the defense. That way I can see the front line first, the linebackers make their plays, and if something happens on the back end with the secondary. Always my perspective, and you're right. Coach Mack watches it from an up-top view. Mm-hmm. And when he breaks it down, he'll see the entire field. I'm seeing it by phase front line, secondary line, and then the back end. And it's always fascinating to see what I see first. It usually starts up front, and then I watch the linebackers make a play. And then the safeties come down. Offensively, if it breaks down up front for the OL, then I'm going to know it immediately because that's where I start to work my way back and outside with that. You're 100% correct. It's different watching the game from that perspective. Keith Bullock, we had on recently, and he watches it from the linebacker position first to the D-line, to the secondary. It is a different perspective that way. Ramon Foster, the challenge, at least one challenge for the Titans in this camp has been trying to pull the offensive line together to make them a cohesive unit. In terms of how you do that, what are the intricate parts that have to go on and the things that you have seen as they have tried to develop that? I would say this, and it's going to sound weird saying it, but failure. You have to have some bad moments. And those bad moments, it forces us to communicate. What do I need to do to service you better? What do you need to do to help me out better? That's always going to play a part as far as developing a group. If it was all peaches and cream from the get-go, guess what? We wouldn't have an opportunity to talk about anything because everything is perfect. And we know the game of football is too many moving pieces for it to ever be a perfect game. So that's where I would start. And then having those guys communicate on the sideline, hey, in this situation – I saw this guy tip his hand, or I saw the linebacker say a word to him. Anytime we hear this, let's do it. It's always the small, finite things that that really builds a team up. And uh, the, the inner moving of players, too, always plays a part in it. We've seen some reserve guys come in um, in these preseason games, and, of course, a breakdown will happen. And you say to yourself, well, this is why we're, we're, we're more successful with this group as opposed to the second group that we had in because you see what works in those situations. It is a beautiful process to watch five guys work at one. It's the only position on the field where five individuals have to be on the same page discussing levels as far as protections, discussing run blocking, whether I'm going, if I'm stronger going to my right as opposed to my left, then knowing that I have to ask for help also. That's always a big part of offensive line play. You're you're known as big dudes that are super tough, but you always ask for help because me talking to you about what I need helps us as a group be better. I've seen the offensive linemen, and I've been a part of a group all five of us were wrong as far as the play goes. But as far as the assignment and completing it with no sacks, 100% right on it. And you score on plays like that because from left to right, as long as you're on the same page, you're going to be more right as far as the outcome of the play than not. So in terms of developing the cohesion of, say, who's going to be the starting five for the Tennessee Titans at the beginning of the regular season, it was actually really good – per Ramon Foster, that throughout the preseason, we saw some different kind of phases of this offense develop. So in the first preseason game, we saw them come out. They did played what a series, two series, something like that. One series. One series. That was it. Yeah. And then they were done Mm -hmm. because it was a great opening drive to start the game. 
In week two, they play for an entire quarter because uh, there was a lot of three and outs there in that first quarter. What you're saying is that something like that is really good. That's the natural flow of the game right there. Everybody, every offensive coordinator has a script, and that script is beautiful until you get punched in the mouth. <laughs> in Minnesota, <laughs> that crowd was loud. It was an on-the-road environment indoors, uh, and it was a little hot. Even though it was indoors, you felt the heat presence of it, too. And also having noticed that uh, it was going to be Malik's game. So now they have an opportunity to hone in on the quarterback, and that makes your job a little bit harder, too, specifically because we had to figure out what Malik was going to be capable of at the quarterback position. It, they made it their job early on to stop the run, which is why they had to go three and out and back on the field. Those types of situations are always good because – not every game is going to be perfect. You can't average, and they did later on in the game, you can't average 10 yards of carry in the first quarter more times than not. Yes, absolutely. No possible way that's, that's going to be the, the case for an offensive line and for a team, too, in preseason. So seeing them go for a quarter and go to the sideline and finally pick it up, they chipped at the rock until Tajay got the big run, and that right there built that cohesion, that belief that, look, even if it's not working early, let's just keep doing our job. And they did and finally had that big break with Tajay. Continue with Ramon Foster on the OTP momentarily. After we remind you, it's always game on with Duncan. So grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on, just like the pros, like Ramon Foster. We need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. Mm -hmm. Two-part question, Ramon Foster, as we continue about Aaron Brewer. Um, it has been said by several people who know ball that he is a better center than he is guard. A... Do you believe that? And B, if so, why? Do I believe that? Yes, I do. Um, just size doesn't really matter a whole lot, but it's certain body frames and types that work better at certain positions. I could play tackle in the NFL, but I'm better off as a guard. Body type fits it. Arms, size, all those things matter. I look at Aaron Brewer and said this, the straights as far as being a starting center in this league, most of them are, are not really big. They hold between as far as being 6'2", 6'1", all the way up to 6'4". I wouldn't put a 6'6 center in the game at all. I know there's one around the NFL. I wouldn't do that, just the height difference of it. You know, as far as the quarterback seeing them and leverage too. He's strong. He's quick. He moves well side to side. He can pull around trash is what we've seen. Not trash, but around the sure. guard tackles <laughs> yeah. and tight ends. We've seen him do those things. And he doesn't have to w carry the blunt of having a one-on-one -on -one each and every play. Most times he line up, he will have a shade or he'll be uncovered. The, his biggest task that he's going to get is having a linebacker trying to run through his face or if they go a solid five down, meaning they'll have a man over him and two guys over both center, I mean both guards. That's his only adversity he's ever going to have to have. And just, he's smart. That always plays a part in it. The center probably has to be the second smartest guy on your team, aside from the quarterback. He should know almost everything that the quarterback does, except for the routes, potentially. Shells, coverages, defenses, strong weak, seeing safety shift down. I know he's capable of doing those things because he's still here on this team, and he's been around to know the system. He may be one of the five best overall athletes on this team. Does that make a big difference in his success at that position? He does. On that Tajay run we speak about in Minnesota, if he isn't limber enough, athletic enough to cut off that big nose tackle, that play is dead. When I saw that, I pointed to people at, at my job in my morning show and said, without Aaron Brewer, this play is dead because that tackle is going to uh, – that D tackle was going to tackle him. He was strong enough to cut him off and quick enough to wall him off so that he could take that leaping run for the touchdown. Those types of things is, is what make you great. Let's go to Kelsey in Philadelphia. He's a guy that we rave about because why he's great in space and he's quick and he's tough. You have a guy just like that in Nashville and Aaron Brewer. And I say this, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about what he could be because all it takes is – the way we get noticed, offensive linemen, is being good in space. If Derek or Tannenhill or Traylon or D-Hop have a screen down the sideline and he's running up the sideline making blocks, 
that's where the conversation is. This guy's a stud, which we'll know that, but the rest of the world will see that, and that's when he starts to get in the conversation of Pro Bowl and top centers in the league, and that's where you get noticed when you play a position like that. So, yes, Mike, his athletic ability is going to do nothing but great things for this team, considering, of course, staying healthy, sure, keeping his strength, and staying on top of his game. Well, Andy can do a backflip. Well, that's what I'm talking about. It's I mean, crazy. Yeah. I mean, they <laughs> utilized know. him at one point in the backfield mm-hmm. when he first got here because he he does have some unusual skills. Let me ask you about Peter Skaronsky. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the Titans took him at number 11, the whole world said, massive win for the team. He's going to be here for however many years. He's going to be – he has the potential to be a Pro Bowl-type player. What you've seen so far of Skaronsky, does he meet the hype? You know the best thing about Peter Skaronsky? Okay. We hadn't heard a word about him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. Mike, to get around that question, yes. Um, he has the pedigree, the smarts, and the poise. Uh, I've watched him on the sideline. Nothing excites him, which is good. Uh, he doesn't seem like he's a deer in the headlights whenever he lines up. And he finishes and understands the game. Uh, watching him and Andre Dillard work with each other, you can tell communication's been at an all-time high. But not just that, the confidence of it, too. He's going against somebody who's an all-pro here in Nashville and Jeffrey Simmons. That is one, by far one of the best tests any offensive lineman can have in this league is to battle him every day in practice or most days. Uh, I like what I see out of the young guy. The rookie is going to have a huge challenge in front of him because if I was a D lineman, I'd try to run down his face, okay, just to test him, just to see what he's capable of. But everything that I've seen so far in the preseason, they've tried that, and he's pushed back. And he is a name that you don't hear – during our games, right? You don't mention them. And that's the best possible thing you can do. But this is also the case. His run blocking has been well, and his pass pro too. They run efficiently on left and right side of the ball because that interior, that Brewer, Bronstall, and uh, Peter, they have held their own up the middle. And I would say the young fellow is a big part of that. You know, you touched on something that I was going to mention, which is the Titans are – done with training camp now they're getting into the flow of what a regular season is going to be like and this team has come off of this offensive line has come off of weeks of going up against the titans defense and there's a lot of strong defensive linemen on that side of the ball how beneficial is that to them for their preparation especially when you're developing that cohesion you've got a lot of new faces and you're going up against some dudes on the defensive side of the ball. And you're going to see some in week one in New Orleans, too. That is a very underrated defense. It is very underrated. They have outside rushers and guys up the middle that can get to the quarterback on top of some one of the best linebackers in the NFL, too. Um, But that's good, though, Amy. On the the, the status of um, I know there was a lot of trash talking. I know they knew that they had to go push and fight and get the most out of this bunch. You got to think of it. Other than Aaron Brewer, Everybody on this offensive line is new or have low experience here in Nashville on how they play. And I know a challenge was probably pushed out to them, hey, go make those guys tough. And as far as from the defensive line, and they did. Um, we heard early, of course, Dillard versus Arden Key being a thing. We, Jeff and Peter Skaronsky going at it. It's not an easy day with when, when uh, Brewer has to take on Tierra. You know, all those things, and I feel like they've answered the call as far as this training camp suggests. Uh, Battle-tested is one thing in practice. We've seen some of their fruits of their labor in these preseason games. I'm confident that this group can be, can be, the reason this offense is, is successful. Are they blocking things differently in the run game from what you've seen in the Tim Kelly offense so far than what you've seen them do in the past? What I've seen from this group is this, and I'm not sure if many people have paid attention to it. Their double teams are solid. The way I've seen uh, Daniel Bronsko and Chris Hubbard engage to move a guy to the second level or watching Peter Skaronsky and Aaron Brewer block on a backside zone play, I don't think we've paid enough attention to the way their combination blocks have been up front. It's funny because we always say in the NFL, you're not blowing people off the line of scrimmage. I've actually seen this group move the line. Coaches need one yard. I've seen sometimes in the run game, 
these guys get a yard and a half, two yards. Like the line of scrimmage moves forward. And I didn't want to believe it because I'm like, this can't be possible in the NFL. You don't move bodies like this. You don't move the line of scrimmage. That's been one consistent phase that I've watched this group that I hadn't seen in years past. And maybe it's because, Mike, Amy, those dudes are trying to prove themselves. Think about the way this group is set up. Sign Chris Hubbard early uh, in the training camp. Andre Dillard's on a prove-it deal, and essentially, to be a starter, you got a rookie who's got a lot of pressure on him, a center with a lot of pressure on him. On a, on a franchise tag. On a franchise tag. Yeah. And then you got Brown School coming from another team trying to prove himself, too. It's fit to where you put a T-bone in the middle of a pack of dogs and say, y'all better eat. And they seem to be catching up to, to eating and making other teams pay for it. What's your concern that hangs out there as you've seen this group now for over five weeks together? It's always the first live game, the first two or three live games, wondering how you can protect the quarterback. We've seen them do it in a good fashion for the most part, some leakage here or there. But making sure that Ryan Tannehill stays upright is always going to be the biggest question for almost any offensive line. But specifically for this one, um, they hadn't gone an entire game with doing that. Uh, you always worry about it until you see it. And that's my only contingency when it comes down to this offensive line. Them seeing the stunts and games up front, that doesn't bother me. It is the finish of the play. If Ryan Tannehill wants to hold on to the ball or if he starts to scramble outside of the pocket, can you protect him long enough? But you're confident from what you've seen that this offensive line, barring injury, is going to be better than last year's Titans offensive line. Yes. I I'll definitively say that. I do think they'll be better, and you know why. It's because you have that five that's kind of gone into that fox den together to say this is about – this offense lies on our shoulders as far as us being successful. You have the running backs. You had the addition of DeAndre Hopkins. You have the same quarterback. Chig would expect to be so much better this year too with some help. It falls on their backs, but I'm a, I'm a firm believer that they can get this job done. More with Ramon Foster momentarily after we remind you that SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. If you haven't heard the name yet, get used to it because you'll be hearing it a lot more this season. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or to any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So Titans fans can fan. Well done, Amy. Thank you. Ramon Foster, uh, I guess we call it a bye week before week one. What do teams get done during this week? Small spurts of this week of the actual game plan. Week one issues that have to be hashed out. Uh, look at the tendencies that New Orleans had last year. See what's the bread and butter that they're going to go to. Uh, you get an extra jump on film study, which film is always big for pros. How can I watch those trench monsters that they have on the other side of the ball uh, offensively? You probably go back and look at Las Vegas film to see what Derek Carr is all about. What kind of pressures did he fall victim to? Um, having the uh, uh, ability to figure out what packages will they use as far as what their offense could be. Um, and, and it's really just breaking down the bread and butter and finding tendencies and getting as much film as you possibly can this week before that pressure of week one opener jumps on you. How excited are you for week one? You don't understand how excited <laughs> I, I, I I got in retirement and was like, all right, I'm done, y'all. I don't want to do this football <laughs> thing. And I find myself, thanks to you guys, being knee deep into paying attention to what the NFL is all about. And I am excited. I say all the time, we get four seasons throughout the, the year, right? Summer, spring, fall, and winter. Football should be included in that because <laughs> <laughs> it's that fun. And imagine how this city is going to be when it's week one. Love it. And for mm -hmm. you, do you almost appreciate your career more now based on the fact that you're doing this job, doing radio on 104.5, joining us for Titans Radio, doing sidelines? Does it make it even more say, wow, I did that? Hey, you know what? I had that thought in Minnesota. Because I was like, there's so many people on the sideline. I need room. <laughs> but then I had to realize there's a business outside of what I did that happens on the sidelines. And I'll even say this, too. My pathway into which I got those 11, being undrafted. So I can, uh, I can appreciate the guys, you know, like an Aaron Brewer. I can appreciate all those guys that's fighting for ro roster spots right now. Reggie Robertson's. I get their struggle. I get what's happening. Um, and I just try to 
view it from that standpoint, literally from the bottom of the bottom as an undrafted guy to being a starter in this league for double-digit years, uh, yeah, I get excited for the process of what this season is all about. That's awesome. He's pretty good. He's really good. He's pretty good. Now, yeah. Pittsburgh week, I'm not sure what we're going to do oh, with him. Oh, he can't him. go. He can't even go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he's sorry. Study, he's not even going to be allowed to go. No, I just don't He'll even put anybody on the sideline. He'll have to take a Greyhound bus to... You yes. know what? I'm getting threats on both sides of this. <laughs> I might have to take I've got people in Pittsburgh talking. i got people here. Well, i got news for you. They ain't paying you anymore. I know. You're we are. Correct. <laughs> yes. Yes. We are so glad to have you as part of our team. Yes. And uh, so much fun to just talk ball with you. Have a Snickers. You've done a fine job in the you Snickers hot it. seat. You, you have earned it. Snickers really satisfies. It does. It really does. And he's handing one to Amy. I got to. How nice. He knows. How nice. <laughs> For Ramon Foster and Amy <laughs> Wells, I'm Mike Keith. Thanking you for joining us for the OTP. Tighten up.